Welcome back everyone. It's time again for one of my favorite things, which is to look at what super investors are doing with their portfolios. The reason I love it so much is because these super investors, they control at least a hundred million dollars. So at a minimum, it's a hundred million, but most of them, they manage over billions, billions and billions of dollars, many of them two, three, four billion dollars. And we get to see what they're buying and what they're selling. I view it very similarly to if you're trying to learn golf, looking at what Tiger Woods is doing. You're looking at the best in the industry and what they're doing. If you're, you're playing basketball and you wanna learn how to uh, do a better shot, you're looking at Steph Curry, you're looking at LeBron James. These are the LeBron James and Steph Curry of investing. These are the biggest investors that control the most money and they've had really good returns. Some of these people have beat the market for a long period of time. So I'm very excited about this. We have a lot of them to jump into. In this video, we have a very strong slate of investors. We have Warren Buffett, we have Bill Ackman, He's made a couple trades this, this last quarter. We have Chuck Ockrey. We have Dev Cantasari with Valley Forge Capital. We have Chris Hone with the Children's Investment Fund. That's a big one. He's been on a roll. And then we have Carl Icahn. We're gonna be looking at what he's doing. We have Bill and Melinda Gates, and we have Christopher Bloomstrand, and we have Michael Burry. So I believe that's nine different investors, very strong investors. A lot of them to go through. The goal here is going to be giving context and perspective, not just looking at what they bought and sold, but trying to give perspective into why they made these decisions. So we have a lot to get into. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, just a reminder as we start off, if you like this type of content, make sure to hit the little like button and ring that bell so you get notifications whenever I upload a new video. Now to start off, we're going to be looking at the king himself, Warren Buffett, who manages around $700 billion, give or take. Part of his portfolio is public. Part of it is wholly owned companies. The portion we're going to be looking at today is the public traded portfolio. And he's annualized around a 20% return for 40 years, which is the best record of anyone ever that's ever existed so far. There's been people that have outperformed Buffett over shorter periods of time, maybe stretches of like 10 to 15 years, but nobody even close to a 40 year period. So he is so far the best investor to ever live by the math and by the results. And that's how he built this massive, massive company. Now, if we look at the Buffett portfolio, I wanna go ahead and just look at the last quarter. Because again, what we're looking at here is Q4 of 2023. So we're just looking at what they did towards the end of last year, how they positioned their portfolio going into the new year. We can filter this by the trades they did and look at the biggest ones going down the list. First of all, we have a sale a reduction in 77% of the holding in Hewlett Packard. So it's interesting to see that he's really stepping out of that one. I've never liked Hewlett Packard. I've always felt like it's a value trap. And I feel like that's the issue that Buffett gets into sometimes. If we go down the list, we have one that I do like his ownership of. Buffett loves energy companies. And he added to his stake of Chevron. You can see a 15% addition to Chevron. That makes up around 0.7% of the portfolio. So that's a fairly large addition. He also added to Occidental Petroleum. Buffett has recently complimented the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, saying that the, the, you know, the management there is fantastic and he has very high confidence level in them. So he wants to own, and I believe he does own a significant portion of Occidental Petroleum. He bumped up his stake, which is another 0.34% of the portfolio. Now there is one company that he sold. The news is that he trimmed Apple. Now, when you hear that news that Buffett trimmed Apple, that's a little bit shocking. And that's what we saw all throughout Twitter. We saw on major news outlets that Buffett trimmed Apple. The problem with the word trim in the, the context of investing is it can mean a lot of things. It means you sold a portion of your holding. It can mean 10, 20, 30, 40%. So you could trim a company by 40% and that would be accurate. In this case, I believe the word trim is being used a little loosely here. He sold 1%, 1.09% of his total Apple stake. So he trimmed it by 1%. I think that's important to have that context. Now, of course, we don't know exactly why he did this, but there's a couple data points we can look at. First of all, I wanna put this in the context of his total holding size in Apple. Currently right now, Apple makes up 50.19% of the public portfolio. Last year, the same quarter last year, it made up 39%. So it went from a 39% weighted position to 50%, which 
Look at the stock price the beginning of last year. It was trading at 130. Now Apple's trading at 182. So over that past year, as Apple has grown and outperformed a lot of other companies, it's grown in proportion in its public portfolio from around 40% to around 50% of the portfolio. Currently right now, Warren Buffett has more exposure to Apple than he's ever had in the history of time. He's owned more of it at a higher percentage today. Now, another thing that we can look at, it's interesting that Buffett sold 1% of the company. He reduced that much of his holding. When we look at the buybacks that Apple does, they're always buying back their stock because they generate so much cash. If we look at the past maybe 10 years and we look at the past one year specifically, Apple bought back 2.38% of their shares outstanding, meaning that every shareholder, they increased their holding size of it around that 2%. So even though Buffett reduced his stake by 1%, the buybacks make it so that Buffett still owns a higher percentage of equity in the company. So in terms of people making a big deal about Buffett trimming Apple, I personally think that's a lot to do about nothing. He's not really trimming it to any meaningful amount. Now, there are some other sales here that I think are very interesting. For example, looking down the list, he also reduced his position in Paramount by 32%. So another 0.13% of the portfolio, he sold off 30 million shares. Now, Paramount's a company that I believe has been a clear mistake for the Buffett portfolio since day one. And I've said that since the very beginning. I've never truly believed that Paramount has been a good buy. And I've always thought the company resembles more of a value trap than a value play. So I'm actually happy to see this move. I'm happy to see for Buffett and Berkshire shareholders that he's moving out of this company because I do not believe that Paramount's going to make significant gains in the future and becoming a streaming powerhouse. When you look at streaming companies, which I have a, I've spent a lot of time looking into these companies, I have a major holding in Netflix, scale is the most important thing. How many subscribers they have at what type of revenue per subscriber. And Netflix has much greater scale than any other company. Netflix is highly profitable and Paramount's not even close. They're not even in the running. We can look at the list here. We have Netflix at 260 million subscribers. So 260 at an average monthly revenue per subscriber above $11 and it continues to go up. We have Disney at 150 million. They are, are starting to come down a little bit as they raise prices. And then you have Paramount down there at 63 million. That's not enough to become profitable. So Paramount continually struggles and they're in this tough situation where they have to become the supplier and license and sell off content to the bigger streamers as they continue to compound and make gains. If, if I was hoping something good for the Buffett portfolio, I would hope that he'd buy Netflix instead, which has proven to be profitable, generating $7 billion last year while Paramount continually loses money. Now, of course, it's down around 5% because Buffett's selling it, but we also have the trading over the past year. Paramount is down 46% over just the past year. When Buffett was asked why he invested in Paramount, he laughed and basically said, let's see. And then the hope for Paramount shareholders, the only way that they had to justify this holding was hopefully they get acquired. That's the play. Maybe Apple or Amazon will buy Paramount, but it's not easy for that to happen either because nobody wants to own the legacy media components. But overall, looking at the changes to the Buffett portfolio today, it doesn't look like too much change. He still owns a ton of Apple. He's still bullish on energy, adding to the big oil companies, and he's reducing and moving around some stakes in these smaller positions like Hewlett Packard and Paramount. Now, next up, we have one of the most public super investors, Bill Ackman. Most of you know about him. He manages right now around... $11 billion. He runs a portfolio strategy that's highly concentrated and he invests in companies that he considers to be dominant free cash flow producing companies. He also has managed to have around a 15% annualized return for the past 15 years. So he's had a pretty good return and he also does some macro bets. He likes to hedge his portfolio and buy different insurance instruments on it. Now, if we look at the biggest trades he did last quarter, the single biggest one is a reduction in lows. He reduced this holding position by 82%. That's a massive reduction. See, this is really moving out of a position here. He is liquidating his lows holding. That represented 12.48% of the portfolio. Now, this isn't short term because he's held lows for a long period of time. He first bought into the company back in 2018, according to Dataroma. So he's held the company for well over five years and Lowe's has outperformed Home Depot. So he, he got the better side of that trade. And it's overall done really well. Lowe's has been a market beating position for, for uh, Bill Ackman. But now he's saying it's time to move on to other things, maybe better valuations, maybe better companies. The next one that he reduced is Chipotle, another top position. He reduced this holding by 13.49%. 
which is 2.8% of the portfolio. So not nearly as big of a move as the lows, but he did sell a meaningful amount of Chipotle. Now, when I look at this position in the context of his entire portfolio, at least from his US positions here, we see that Chipotle is his top position, 18.15% of the portfolio, even after reducing it. Out of all the companies in Bill's portfolio, Chipotle has been the best performing. It's been like a rocket, especially recently as of the past six months. If we look at the stock price here, you can see the movement in it. Right now, Chipotle trades at $2,600. I bought the company around $1,900 last year. That was my intrinsic value of it. And then it quickly traded up to $2,600. So this thing has really rocketed up. When we look at the stock price, you can see it clearly here. Year to date, it's up 16%. So even after he trimmed it, it kept racing up. But over the past year, it's up 61%. Even in just the past six months, it's up 40%. Why is Chipotle doing so well? Because the company's growing same-store sales faster than investors expected. It's opening up more restaurants than investors expected, and it's growing the top line revenue at the high end of its guidance. Basically, every way that you measure a restaurant, Chipotle is doing really well in all of those measurements. So this company has performed excellently. It's a massive position for Bill Ackman, but he is taking some gains. And in my opinion, if I look at the fact that he sold 13% in Q4 of 2023, the fact that Chipotle continued to race up another 16% this year makes me believe that he could be trimming the position today. He could be trimming more of it as time goes on as the company races up. Because even though I'm bullish on Chipotle and I thought the company was worth $1,900, it really has gone up fast, faster than I would expect. So I don't blame him for wanting to take some gains and maybe redeploying that money. All in all, when I look at his portfolio, the biggest one he moved out of is Lowe's. And I agree with him on that trade. You'll notice in my portfolio, I've not held any type of home builders. I haven't held any type of banks that lend for homes. I sold out of Pool Corporation, which it evolves around new homes and new builds. I don't own Home Depot or Lowe's. I don't own any company that has anything to do with homes. And that is for a specific reason. I think that with the higher interest rates, it's gonna be very difficult for any company that relies on buying new homes, renovating new homes, repairing homes, doing anything around them. So Lowe's is one of those companies that obviously is focused around dealing with people that go and do home repairs and upgrades and backyard projects and all that type of stuff. And with interest rates as high as they are, everything to do with homes is slowing down. So I like this move from Bill Ackman. I think that it's gonna be harder to squeeze out great gains from Lowe's and Home Depot this year than it was previous years. Overall, still a very strong portfolio that I think is likely to outperform the market. Now, next up, we have a legendary investor, Chuck Cockery, who manages $11 billion and he's annualized 24% returns. So he's beat the market by a wide margin. And he's done so with a very simple buy and hold strategy that he refers to as the three-legged stool strategy. First, you buy really good businesses. Companies that have high returns on capital is the biggest thing. And then you buy businesses which have great management that treat you as though they know you and they respect you as a shareholder, even though they don't. And then you buy companies that have ample reinvestment opportunity and long runways of growth. Doing that and holding them long term has led to outstanding outperformance. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple different trades that Chuck Ockrey did. When we look at this, we see that he first of all trimmed, he trimmed his MasterCard position by 13%. That's 2.83%. Now that's a bit surprising to me because when I do analysis on MasterCard, which is one of my holdings, I have to admit I, I have a big stake in MasterCard and I've actively bought it last year. When I do analysis on it, I can't find any... Uh, weaknesses in the armor. As far as I'm concerned, the company is as strong as it's ever been throughout its entire history. There's no realistic, credible competitors to it. MasterCard continues to grow at double digit rates. They continue to have great capital allocation, incredibly high returns on capital. Uh, it's just uh, an incredible holding, but he trimmed it by 13%. That's a little odd. That's surprising that, that Acre would do that. Then of course we have Visa, which he also reduced by 27%, another 2.83%. Now, the fact that he reduced these as a percentage of his portfolio, the exact same, makes me believe that he's just looking for areas to trim, to, to maybe raise cash. When we look at the other trades he did here, Moody's Corporation, another one that I think is, is outstanding and in a very strong position right now, he reduced that one by 6%. So it's a bit shocking to see him reduce some of his best performing companies that continue to be 
in very good standing. These are companies that have incredibly wide moats. I would say that companies like Moody's, Visa, MasterCard have even grown their moat over the past year. When I look at the reasons, the possible reasons that Chuck Ockery would reduce these holdings, there's a couple things we can look at. First of all, Ockery is no longer himself managing this portfolio. He's done it for long enough. He's made a lot of money. He's stepping back and giving different uh, different lieutenants, people in charge to manage the portfolio, hopefully in the same type of style that he's managed it. But we know it's never the same. When the main person that's done the job for like a decade, they step back from it, the type of lessons that they say and the type of things that they teach, they're never going to be one-to-one -one replicated by the managers of the company, by the people that carry on. So even though it's supposed to be managed in similar fashion, it's difficult to teach the real-life lessons that Chuck Ockery has learned and pass those off to others. It's not simply enough to just talk about them and recite them, but actually living them and going through them is a whole different thing. So one of the, the things that may be happening here is maybe the people running it now simply are running it a bit differently than Chuck Ockrey did. Maybe they're, they're looking to take gains in their top holdings. To me, this would be a big red flag if I wanted to invest the way that Chuck Ockrey did. I like the way that he did it over the past 10 years. So if they're doing something differently, then that would be a red flag for me. Another explanation that I think is actually more probable, more likely, is that there's simply been redemptions and he has to raise money. That's the case with managing a fund. When you manage $11 billion, let's see, he manages $11.8 billion. At some point or another, those investors will want some of their money back. They'll say, I have a new house in the Hamptons I wanna buy. I wanna buy this new place in Miami. I wanna buy a cruise ship or whatever it is, right? They buy these extravagant things and they pull out some of the money. When they do that, Chuck Ockrey, his fund, needs to sell some shares to raise that cash. That's called a redemption. And it appears as though they've had a couple redemptions, a couple people selling out of the portfolio, wanting them to raise some money to give back to them. So they may just be targeting some of their best, best performing holdings, saying, well, we've made a ton of money in these companies, so let's just take some of the gains and then we can pay off these redemptions. So I think that may be another explanation as well. Overall, the Ocre portfolio still is incredibly strong and the companies he has in it all meet those type of qualifications. But I must admit, I don't like the trading going on here. Selling out of your biggest winners, reducing size of your biggest best performing companies is usually a recipe that's not great for holding long-term compounders. We can even look at MasterCard. They sold a portion of it in Q4 of last year and it's already up 12% this year. So they missed out on some significant gains already. And that's the problem with trying to trim these type of companies. Now next up we have Dev Cantasario with Valley Forge Capital Management. Dev manages around three and a half billion dollars and he has had around a 20% plus annualized return for the past 10 years. So he's done really well so far. If you were to ask Dev, what type of investing strategy do you do? He would say that he's a bit of a disciple of Warren Buffett. He follows Warren Buffett in his teachings and in the principles of investing. And he always is listening to Buffett interviews. He's listening to Buffett shareholder meetings, trying to learn what he can from him. He invests in companies that he considers to be incredibly high quality based around the moat that they have, the Buffett-like moat, but not only a moat, he considers them to be monopolistic, companies that are almost impossible to compete with. So when we look at Dev's portfolio, it is highly concentrated into these companies. He only has, let's see, uh, nine positions. We have uh, eight total holdings, so only eight. And the huge majority of this is in six of them. You have FICO at 29%. Now, he didn't buy FICO with 29% of his portfolio. He bought it with a smaller percentage, and FICO, like a rocket, took off and it went up to 29%. But his other holdings have been no slackers. S&P Global has been in the portfolio for a decade. He's owned this one for a very long period of time. The same thing with MasterCard and Moody's. Intuit has also been a company that he's loved for a very long period of time and Visa. These ones represent the huge majority of his portfolio. He's highly concentrated into these companies and they have a lot of commonalities. When I look at FICO, when I look at S&P Global and I look at uh, Moody's, all of these companies have to do with credit. You have S&P Global and Moody's, which are both a duopoly in the global credit industry. They're rating all the company's bonds to get lower interest rates on them. And then you have Fair Isaac, the creator of the FICO score, which is a monopoly in origination. Origination of loans that have to do with cars, homes, solar systems, 
anything, anything that a consumer needs a big loan for, you're going to get a FICO score on it. There's been other competitors that have tried to take Marketplace like Vantage Score, but FICO has continued to beat them out. They have too big of a monopoly, they're considered too big of a standard, and they have incredible pricing power. Dev realized this, he acknowledged it long ago. He came out on public interviews and said, FICO is undervalued. I'm buying a lot of it. And it's gone up multiples over that time period. But then he also continues to do something that I consider to be a bit of a superpower. There's a lot of investors that say they're buy and hold, but as soon as a stock goes up 20%, they're saying is now a good time to sell. Dev is one of these guys that continues to really buy and hold because he makes such good decisions on his initial buys that he can continue to hold companies throughout thick and thin. He especially is good at holding companies after they've gone up a lot. So if we look at his trading over the past quarter, the previous quarter before this one, he made literally no transactions. Nothing, not a buy, not a sell. So there wasn't even a transaction of Q3 in 2023. But Q4, we finally have three. He reduced his FICO position by 4%. Only 4%. Most people would have sold out of this company long ago. Why would they have sold out of FICO? Well, look at the stock. Look at the gains over the past year. Just this year, it's up 15%. Over the past year, it's up 88%. The past five years, it's up 430%. He's held on to it the entire time and added to his stake. It's incredible the, the diamond hands he has. He really just holds on to these companies despite seemingly being crazy valuations where it would scare other people into selling. So I find it really incredible, almost a superpower, how he seems to just buy into these compounding machines. He holds on to them. Every once in a while, he'll change his mind and move around one company. But overall, the portfolio mostly stays the same. But FICO was one reduction, which represented around 1.31% of his portfolio. A company that he added to last quarter was Visa. He added slightly to it, 0.78%. So not a meaningful change. And then he sold 0.29% of MasterCard, another non-meaningful change, each of them representing 0.05% of the portfolio. When I look at his portfolio, I share many of these holdings because I think they're some of the best. And I believe his portfolio will continue to compound at a very high rate. Even aside from the high valuations, these companies continually grow faster than the market. On average, they're growing their free cash flow per share around double the average of the market. The market grows at around 8% per year. These companies are growing their free cash flow per share around 15 to 20%. So even though they trade at higher valuations, they have much faster intrinsic value growth rates. And I see that across his entire portfolio. With FICO being his largest holding, I've looked at this company in depth. I've assessed it, I've done analysis on it, and I agree that it's a fantastic company. What prevents me from buying it is simply being a little scared about the valuation. It trades at a 50 Ford PE, which to me just seems nuts. And then you have a free cash flow yield that's also 1.2%. So I get a little scared about the valuation today. I don't feel like it's a great time to buy it as far as I'm concerned, but I do acknowledge the company is incredible and it's growing its free cash flow per share incredibly fast. It's just breathtakingly fast. Overall, I think that Dev Cantasaria, Valley Forge Capital Management are at the top of their game. Now, next up, we have Chris Hone from the Children's Investment Fund, and he manages now a staggering $36 billion. It's grown substantially since last time we looked at his portfolio because they had incredible performance last year. In fact, if we look at an article, this is from the New York Times, it goes over the top performing hedge funds in the world. TCI was number one. Chris Hone was at the very top of the list. So he had the best performance, the best net gains of any hedge fund last year. He gained a reported $12.9 billion in 2023. That's some nice gains there, an extra $13 billion. When we look at his portfolio, it's full of only a few companies that are service-based monopolies. So we can go ahead and take a look here. The top holding is General Electric, which is one that I don't have much knowledge about, but that's right up Chris Hone's alley. He loves these type of industrial companies. He can do incredibly good analysis on them. And out of the bets being made on GE, he won. If we look at GE, look at the performance of this stock over the past year, he won in this analysis, 76% over the trailing year. So he made a huge bet on it, made it his top position, and then it went up 76%. Now, another one that he's betting on is Canadian National Railway, which I love the railway industry. He also owns Canadian Pacific, uh, Kansas City Southern, which is one that I own. But I think out of these two companies, I like Canadian Pacific, Kansas City Southern. I think it's better than Canadian National Railway because 
Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern, I think, has better leadership that's making better moves and they're winning market share. Canadian National Railway is struggling to keep their market share. So I wouldn't be surprised if Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern outperforms Canadian National Railway. But either way, both of them are likely to have positive performance. Now, when we take a look at his trades over the past quarter and we see what he bought and sold, one of the most confusing parts about this is Microsoft. He bought a huge concentrated position, over 11% of his portfolio into Microsoft in Q4. But then if we look at the quarter prior to that one, Q3 of 2023, he sold his entire Microsoft position. So he sold it one quarter and then bought it back which is something that I haven't seen before. I haven't seen a big investor like this sell 10 million shares of Microsoft and then buy it back the very next quarter. Seems very odd to me. I almost believe that there's some like data issue or something, but either way, right now, he owns Microsoft as a large concentrated position. And that's good to know because Microsoft is one of the companies that a lot of us own. It's good to know an investor as good as him is buying into this company and still believes strongly in it. Now, another company that he added to last quarter was Moody's, which I'm also happy to see because I was adding to that company last quarter as well. I'm very bullish on Moody's. I really like the company. So he's adding to that one another 1.8% of the portfolio. He trimmed slightly the railroads, Thermo Fisher Scientific. These are such small trims that I don't think they're actually that meaningful. And then there's some tiny changes, 0.06%, 0.03% in these other companies. I don't believe that that's meaningful. His is another portfolio similar to Dev Cantasaria's that I think is bulletproof. I think the companies that he owns are these highly concentrated industries, incredibly wide moats. In many cases, they're, they're not an illegal monopoly, but they own very monopolistic like positions in their markets. And he has very concentrated positions into the top six. So he's really bullish on these companies and I think they're gonna serve him well. Now, next up we have Carl Icahn, the legend himself who manages around 11 to $12 billion. Now, I must admit, I'm not a fan of Carl Icahn. When I've looked through his history and his dealings with different companies, I find him to be more of an aggressive activist corporate raider that focuses on short-term gains, squeezing out profits at the expense of a company's long-term prosperous future. So if I owned a company that I was invested in, I, I was shareholder in it, I would not want Carl Icahn to be interested in that company or have a stake in it. I believe that his dealing in the company is more likely to damage it than to help it. And that's been the case with many companies in the past, like Blockbuster. When he had Blockbuster against Netflix, he was part of the reason that Blockbuster failed, trying to change their strategy in competing with Netflix. When we look at his portfolio, I try to see what he's buying and if there's any gems that he's revealed. When I look at it this quarter, the first company that he reduced was First Energy Corp. He only reduced it by 2.7%. He bought slightly more Icon Enterprises, 2.69% of his portfolio. And then he also bought a new position, which was American Electric Power. I've looked at this one. It doesn't really interest me all that much. It's just a basic utility company. And he sold out of his small position in Crown Holdings. So overall, looking at his portfolio, no big changes this year. It looks very similar to what it did the previous quarter. Next up, we have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundational Trust. This has $43 billion. So this is massive, but it's not really ran like a typical hedge fund because this is a, a trust that's specifically used for charitable contributions. Now, we don't know the performance of it, but looking at the holdings, it's done really well because the majority of it has been in extremely strong companies, Microsoft, Berkshire, Canadian National Railway, Waste Management. It looks like Bill Gates has sat most of this in his Microsoft stock, which continues to perform incredibly well, and Berkshire stock, which he had donated from Warren Buffett. So these two positions make up around half the portfolio, and both of them, of course, are incredibly strong companies. When I look at the trades over the past quarter, there's a lot of very small trims of equal weight. So this doesn't look like these were being sold for any particular reason other than to raise cash. Bill Gates, for whatever reason, wanted to get a little bit of cash out of his portfolio, so he sold throughout the portfolio in an equal manner. The only company that they bought into, a tiny, tiny position, 0.02%, is VLTO. Not a stock I'm familiar with, but it seems like it's a water company. So I'm not sure if he bought into that for investments or to have some sway in the company to be used for something he wants. But either way, that was the only buy this quarter. Next up, we have the value investor, Christopher Bloomstrand, that manages around $450 million, and he's averaged around 12% annualized returns over the past decade. Now, when we look at his trades over the past quarter, we can see that the biggest one is adding to Disney, which I like. I think Disney's a decent trade right now. I think it's a decent company to buy into. 
I'm bullish on Disney's future. It's one of the few companies competing with Netflix that has the, the size and scale to be able to actually make the jump from legacy cable TV to a new streaming, new streaming path. Paramount, on the other hand, is one that he's actually reducing his stake in. He was very bullish on this one, but last quarter he sold out 24%, which I also, of course, like seeing. I think that Disney's a much better bet than Paramount. So I like seeing the money go from Paramount to Disney. I think that that will pay off better. When I look at the other holdings he has here, Dollar General, he added to. This has been a bet that has not paid off. And then there's a lot of other very small, insignificant trades in the portfolio. Overall, I like to see what he's done with his portfolio. One of the biggest bets he's doing right now is doubling and tripling down on Dollar General after the big sell-off. So he owned some of it prior. It got obliterated. Dollar General went down over 50%. And he said, I'm buying more of it. I'm buying more so that the company will eventually recover. I'll make gains in the process. The rest of his companies typically represent lower valuation, free cash flow generative companies. So these aren't the fastest moving companies, but most of them represent lower downside. Now, of course, we can't forget about Michael Burry. He manages currently around $100 million. And let's go ahead and take a look at his most recent activity as of this previous quarter. We'll filter it by the top trades. The first thing he did was sell out of four positions, STLA, EURN, HPP, and CRGY. Two different energy companies, one of them is a car company. He sold 100% of all of these. And this isn't unusual for Michael Burry. The reason that I say that he's very difficult to follow or base your investing strategy off of is because he's radically changing around his portfolio quarter by quarter. His portfolio will look completely different one year to the next. Now, there are some interesting buys that he's done this previous quarter. A couple that stand out to me. First of all, he bought Google. He actually bought Google stock, 5% of the portfolio. He also bought Amazon, another one around 5%. So he's now bullish on Google and Amazon, which both of those I obviously like. I think they're great buys. We have an interesting group of companies he's buying here, and I can find almost no perfectly common theme between these companies. They're in different sectors with different valuations, with different growth rates, with different risk, uh, risk challenges. All of them seem very different, but they've made it into his portfolio. When I look at another theme, he also is betting on China. He bought more of JD.com, big Chinese retailer, similar to Amazon and Alibaba. He bought more into this one as well. He increased both of them by around 2% of his portfolio. And at the end of 2023, he still has the two largest holdings being both Chinese e-commerce companies, Alibaba and JD. So he's buying these companies that have been obliterated over the past year. The Chinese stock market has been in a continual rut, a continual downturn, and he's buying into that fear. I think if you're gonna buy these companies, now's the time. So it makes sense to dive in now if you're gonna do it. Personally, I think there's just a lot of risk there. So you have to know that going in, but that represents around 12% of the portfolio. Now that's gonna wrap up the super investor video this time. We have another nine investors to go through. So we have a whole nother slate to go through as their 13F filings come out. So make sure you have the notification on, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.